And in fact, beyond that, you find a joy in serving others. That's the way you want to be in the world. That's the mode of existence you choose before you meet your day. And the black freedom struggle is the best example of bringing together a quest for unarmed truth and unconditional love in the face of American terrorism for 400 years. That's why we haven't created a black Al-Qaeda in the face of American terrorism. Instead, you get Frederick Douglass and Martin King and Fannie Lou Hamer. You don't get counter-terroristic strategy. No, Frederick Douglass says what? In the face of American terrorism, I want rule of law. I want democracy. Martin King says in the face of American terrorism, apartheid, Jim Crow, I want love and justice. I want democracy. And Mathilde's mother says right at the funeral when her little baby is in the coffin, 14 years old, just dragged him up from Jim Crow, Mississippi, Head is five times the side of his ordinary head. What does she tell the world? I don't have a minute to hate. I'll pursue justice for the rest of my life. Oh, what spiritual depth. What moral wisdom. But what happens when America's terrorized? Do we hear those kind of voices? Or do we hear, we'll hunt them down like cockroaches. We'll kill them on the spot. Who do they think they are messing with us? And I say to myself, if black folk had produced high brow leaders who talked that way about white America, there'd been a civil war every generation. You wouldn't have an American democracy whatsoever. There'd been civil strife. Cell groups everywhere. I tell my white brothers and sisters, when you see Negroes, you ought to just give them a standing ovation. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the democracy. That black freedom struggle is 11 in the loaf. It's 11 in the loaf. That's why Brother Barack is relevant. Not just the color of his skin. We know some white brothers and sisters closer to Martin than some Negroes I know. I mean, I love Claren Thomas. I love my brother. I love him. He's just not that close to Martin. He sides with the strong against the weak. There's a difference. You got to make a choice. But when you tilt toward the weak in a chronic and systematic way, you're tilting toward the leaven in the loaf. And I would say exactly the same thing if America had a black supremacist history. I'd be with the white brothers and sisters. Because they would be in the weak situation. They would be the ones catching hell. It's a moral choice. It's an ethical decision. You see, but we don't have to worry about institutionalized black supremacy in America. <laughs> no worry there. Black folk can have hatred inside of them, not treat white brothers and sisters right, or brown brothers and sisters, or red brothers and sisters, but in terms of an organized, institutionalized arrangement, no, 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 not the chance of a snowball in hell for that. <laughs> not at the moment. Our conversation has to do with how is the struggle against the vicious legacy of white supremacy tied to a discourse on public interest and common good at this particular historical moment when right-wing hegemony is collapsing and American civilization is wavering? And for those of us who take the cross seriously, how do we understand what God wants us to do at this particular moment? Let's just have our dialogue, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. West. I think all of us could have listened to you just go right on. This well, yeah, no, no, I, I <laughs> you, could have, you could have kept going. That was, that was inspiring. Dr. West, we had uh, asked several of our friends to submit questions. And one of them asked uh, that I make his apologies for him because he's not able to be here tonight, uh, but he is a, uh, certainly a great supporter of your work. Dr. William Shaw, president of the National Baptist Convention, uh, could not be here, but he wanted me to ask you. He says, as Barack Obama attempts to appeal to blacks, whites, and others, is he being subtly pressed by some whites to ignore the ugliness of racism, and in so doing, is he absolving white America of their guilt? Yeah, 
it's a, um, that's a very important question. I have great respect for uh, my dear brother Shaw. In fact, I was just talking to brother Jesse Jackson. He said that Reverend Shaw gave a sermon at the National Baptist Convention that was just legendary, historic. Was anybody, was anybody there? <laughs> Jesse telling the truth, right? <laughs> yes, Jesse told me. He said, Brother West, you have got to hear that sermon. I said, well, you send me the tape, though, brother. I, I, I do, because um, Jesse's a rhetorical genius. Y'all know that. Sometimes he might have an excess <laughs> of, of the words flowing. But uh, we all crack vessels, but he's a rhetorical genius, just like Barack's an organizational and a political genius. Everybody got their lane. But uh, no, I think when we think of Barack's campaign, Brother Obama's uh, historic quest, there's always a tension between the quest for unarmed truth and unconditional love on the one hand and the quest for power on the other. The two are never identical. And the question becomes whether that tension is a creative tension or whether it's a destructive tension. Uh, there's, I mean, just to be honest with it, Brother Barack Obama would not be where he is if he looked like the late, great Isaac Hayes. <laughs> and that's before Isaac say a word. That's just sheer appearance. Yeah. Isaac Hayes was a genius. I was just with him two weeks before he died. But his appearance yeah. in and of itself for most white, mainstream white brothers and sisters carries with it anger, a threat. Absolutely. That's how white supremacy operates without language. Just image. image. Just sheer image. I mean, if Sister Michelle Obama looked like Alicia Keys, that might get us some white votes too. Because she's a beautiful black woman from the south side of Chicago. And that kind of black beauty can be a threat, the beauty of a Cicely Tyson and so forth and so on. See what I mean? That's how white supremacy operates without words. So that someone like myself, you see, and then when, you know, I got this book, Hope on the Tightrope, coming out next week, because we all on a tightrope. Barack's on a tightrope, and you on a tightrope, I'm on a tightrope, because I have to say to myself, how can I be true to what God wants me to be, given my calling, which is Socratic, to raise tough questions, and prophetic, to try to expose lies, speak the truth, and die for something bigger than you? How do you remain true to that when your brother is in a quest for power at the highest level on the globe, head of the American project? Because I could speak some truths that could be so unsettling, especially to people who want to vote for Barack, that it could end up doing him in. So you say, well, how do you weigh this thing? You see, and this is why Brother Shaw's question is a difficult one, because on the one hand, you do have to remind folk that any time you talk about race or the vicious legacy of white supremacy, you're talking about something ugly. And you don't want to deodorize it. You don't want to manicure it and sanitize it and sterilize it, because the lives of the people you're talking about past and present are precious and priceless, like any other human life no matter what color. At the same time, you know there's a, there's a small tolerance zone, especially for those white moderates and white independents who will decide the election. So you gotta watch both what you say, but you can't sell yourself out. That's has been in all context. On Sunday, I, I had 11 events in Columbus, Ohio for Brother Barack. Like I read, that's why I'm sick now, because I, uh, I'm really on low energy, <laughs> because I, 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 had, I got the flu and things after, after uh, the eighth event there in Columbus. 